Okay, thank you all for joining. This is the Digital Humanities and Projects in Asian American Studies. I'm Ray Pun, a, a Hashtag Scholar and First Year Experience a Student Success Librarian at Fresno State in California. And I'll introduce myself further in a bit. Just wanted to say thank you all for joining. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put in the chat box. You are welcome to turn off your video and your audio while we go through this and then you can turn it back on later. And I just wanted to say that this project started when I was selected as a Hashtag Scholar late last year, and we were asked to do a webinar or a blog or so forth. And Hashtag is a really um, interesting group. It's a really great network for humanities, arts, science, technology, the digital humanities um, group. And for those who would like to learn more about digital humanities, the tools, I recommend you look at the website. And so this project actually, or this webinar came out because there's been just a series of uh, discussions I've been having with folks who are curious about Asian American studies and intersections with digital humanities, right? Because there seems to be um, a lacking of, of voices and the projects that are, that are out there. But in fact, actually, there's quite a bit, quite a number, and we're going to go over some of the tools and resources and all this fun stuff. And so uh, we're really pleased to have all of you join us and hopefully uh, you'll uh, be able to take back some of these, <coughs> excuse me, some of these skills and experiences back in your institutions. And so I also know that many of you are probably um, quite an expert. Uh, you have probably have designed digital humanities projects in your own disciplines, fields, area studies. Uh, for this uh, process, we uh, design, we made it like, you know, different levels. So you'll, you'll be able to see and apply some of them immediately to your uh, practice. So again, my name is Raymond Pan. I'm the first year student success librarian faculty at Fresno State, part of the California State University system. And I'm also a doctoral student in educational leadership. And one area I've been interested in looking at is service learning and so forth. So this webinar is actually, um, uh, I believe it would be the part one of Asian American studies or ethnic studies in digital humanities and possibly next year because I have to do another one next year. So I'll do a part two. Hi, I'm Victoria Pilato. I'm the digital projects librarian at Stony Brook University. So I want to thank Ray for inviting me to participate in this webinar. Um, I am not a hashtag scholar. Can everyone hear me? By yep. the way. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> I'm not a Hashtag scholar, but I did have a wonderful opportunity working just for a short, very brief amount of time with the Hashtag scholar, um, a graduate, in, graduate student in English here who's taking a digital humanities course, and we met briefly so I can teach him Omeka and how to use that in his digital humanities project. And I'm very impressed by the Hashtag scholars and I'm very happy to be here. Great, thanks. Now since uh, many of you are coming from all over the world, I, I recognize your names, please feel free to type in the chat box where you're from and you can also tweet, you know, live tweet it, uh, you can tag us, uh, our handles are down there and hashtag scholar is the hashtag. But um, please feel free to share uh, where you're from, what institution, are you a professor or a librarian in the chat box. We'll give it a minute or so. Oh cool, UCLA. Florida, wow. Michigan State. Hey, we got some uh, state folks here. Oh, Stanford, very cool. Oh, Canadians. Binghamton. Oh, Stony Brook. Yeah. Hey, isn't that uh, where you are, Victoria? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Hey, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> is she like downstairs or something? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, North Carolina. Very cool. Texas. Welcome. Oh, El Paso. Oh, just defend it. Oh, congratulations, Miguel. Very cool. Oh, I see uh, Kentucky. Okay, and Riverside. Hi, Judy. Good to see you. Uh, Chapel Hill. Okay, Rice University. Okay, so it looks like we have uh, qu quite a number of you from all over uh, the country and in Canada. Thank you for joining. And I really wanted to say you could be basically doing other things like having lunch or doing yoga or something, but you decided to sit here and listen to us. But actually, you may be doing that too. I, I can't see, but 
Um, again, uh, really appreciate you uh, joining us today. And so basically what we're gonna do is talk about these three areas. The first is looking at digital projects in Asian American studies, which is actually um, quite a few um, that we have dug up from our own experiences. And Victoria will talk about her Stony Brook University libraries or her work experiences, some case studies there. And then we'll really um, dive into the intersections of digital humanities and activism. And basically how that in itself has been so uh, fundamental, right? In order to push for um, new ways of thinking, innovations, engagements with the community, especially the ones that are marginalized and how do, how do we um, foster those um, relationships. So first, as everyone may or may not know, May is uh, the Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. It's actually um, quite fitting to have this webinar specifically to uh, address and highlight this. And so that's why I had timed it early on um, to have it in May. And so um, just to let you know that this is actually quite an interesting time because it's also the end of the semester for those who are in a semester system and you can design projects to showcase them specifically on different themes, right? And May happens to be um, one specific topic that you can work on. And with that being said, I think for, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> for Asian American studies in digital humanities, um, we're really thinking about critically about the field, right? <coughs> excuse me. And how um, this webinar is really about two different fields um, up that have tr traditionally been defined as and methodo methodologically and ideologically separate, right? There's Asian American studies and Asian studies, and they, ha they happen to be constantly, unfortunately, uh, conflated, right? And, but they're different areas. And so Asian American studies has in turn focused on racial and ethnic categories and citizenship in terms of what is it to be a citizen in the United States. So really creating that space, right, for um, that both fields really to investigate those interconnections can really help us think more about the regional, transnational, and local identities, and really reconceptualizing Asian American studies. And so digital humanities in itself can really uh, provide that kind of opportunity to do that, and we're gonna be exploring those issues. And so another question you might wanna ask yourself when you're thinking about Asian American studies in digital humanities is, how do these research questions in the projects address or support libraries or librarians? And Victoria and I, we are librarians. And for many of you who might be uh, a scholars and academic uh, teaching faculty, we're, we're happy to share our um, strategies and ideas to help you um, uh, collaborate uh, possibly with your librarians or give some ideas out there. And basically what are the roles, right, of librarians and libraries today in supporting this field? And finally, we wanna really address and reconcile ethnic studies, activism, intersectionality, and digital scholarship, like with, with this whole um, notion that, um, the idea that we're, we're trying to um, create new innovative scholarship, but we're also trying to remember that there are these pressing issues that's going on. For instance, uh, Pacific American culture and studies. And so this is quite interesting. I had positioned this title as Asian American studies, because I think for many of us, we are familiar with the discipline there is an association of Asian American studies, but the lacking of Pacific American studies or the marginalization, right, in terms of not being able to be the Asian Pacific American studies. And I see that there are some places like San Francisco State University, they have Asian Pacific American studies, I believe, or some other, and some other universities. But in terms of the traditional field, Asian American studies under ethnic studies, uh, what do we do with groups that are not in, that, not in those uh, necessarily categories or represented? And actually, We'll be looking at some of those projects and how do you um, create that visibility for those um, cultures that are not represented. So first I wanted to review some of the projects that we've uh, found. The first is the South Asian Oral History Project in the University of Washington Libraries. And so this is quite interesting. This uh, is a partner uh, with um, Deepa Banerjee who is a, a South Asian Studies Librarian up in University of Washington and she works closely with the community with different um, <coughs> um, academic groups to create and facilitate um, oral history videos. So um, this is actually a, a grander project. She's been working on this for quite some time, published quite a bit. But my point is that she has reached out and interviewed folks who have been involved in basically the whole um, Microsoft experience or um, those um, South Asian, <coughs> excuse me, just getting over allergies. Um, 
South Asian diaspora group that is in the Pacific Northwest, right? And what's been going on that there has been a lot of communities out there. So what she's been doing is obviously recording them, transcribing them, making exhibits out of them, working with the library, being that sort of mediator, but really um, also holding events. So in some ways, I think for the high level digital humanities projects like this one, uh, really involves a lot of collaboration and using different kinds of community resources, engaging with different uh, stakeholders and really designing a interface like this website to make it really compelling for those to contribute, for those who can hear and use it for their own teaching and research projects. So I'll leave that as is. So I previously worked at the New York Public Library and one of the things I worked on was um, supporting um, our NYPL labs back in the day where they designed this project called What's on the Menu. And this is really a simple, straightforward menu collection that's been digitized, but looking for transcriptions, looking for people like us to transcribe these menus from all over the world, from all different languages in different time periods. And what's interesting is that the collection with my, uh, back in the day, my um, a colleague at New York Public Library, Rebecca Fetterman, who is the culinary studies librarian and now the coordinator for humanities and social sciences, she still maintains this. It's really a great opportunity to um, look at different kinds of menus and so forth. And it's open source, anyone can do this. And when I was basically uh, one of the research librarians working with different history groups, particularly in local US history and immigration history, we had them come into the library and transcribe. And we wanted to focus specifically on these kinds of menus, like Chinese menus, like restaurants, right? And also Hawaiian. And what it tells us is different kinds of ingredients, different kinds of food and representations for whom, right? Like who are the audience? So this project in itself, obviously you don't have to start collecting menus to do it. You can out start using this uh, database, this uh, digital humanities projects for your own teaching and engage with your students to ask questions about what kind of food, who are the audience or the, um, the customers, the location. And of course, most of them are from New York, the menus, but it's a telling sign to see the transition of different kinds of food catered to the American taste. And so um, these menus are obviously, um, a lot of them are done. When they're done, you can see that means that they are fully transcribed. But my point is to engage with students, with the local communities, the Chinese communities, the Hawaiian communities, Pacific Islanders, so forth, and looking at what has been created and who owns restaurants. It usually does tell you in a couple of them. And it's quite interesting to see that it's, it's a mix, right? You got people who are, the um, heritage folks who actually manage restaurants and those uh, who are not owning the restaurants. And a lot of them are in hotels. What does that say about that as well, about the culture? And is it uh, some form of uh, cultural appropriation? So I think, um, you know, these different periods also putting into the position of um, major events in world history can really uh, give some context, right? Um, because I'm sure if you look up, um, Japanese restaurants in the United States during the 40s, you may get a different kind of perspective, which I, I'm, I'm actually, I haven't actually done that, but I feel like I want to try now and see, but I'm, I'm guessing it would be quite different because of the elements of 9066, the executive order that we'll talk more in a bit. And here's another one that I think would be uh, very interesting. So uh, in terms of transcribing menus, um, basically it's an opportunity to make the menus more readable. A lot of them are handwritten in, in terms of like scripts. So a lot of them are in, in not really el uh, ineligible or like not a readable, right? Um, so, so that's sort of the way of transcribing them and you can do it digitally. So there's a lot of crowdsourcing. People do this with Civil War diaries. That seems to be the latest and hottest thing, um, you know, for the digital humanities projects. But we have menus that, that could seriously be um, used to transcribe or translate. There are also, you see here, there's a German, uh, I think this is probably German or, or uh, some other um, language out there that um, is not necessarily um, accessible. Yes, thank you, Sarah. That's right, English only movements. And so this project here I wanted to go over is quite fascinating. Uh, many of you might know this, came from Stanford University Libraries with under uh, Dr. Gordon Chang's leadership, who is a historian there. And I actually had a chance to meet with him back 
in March under the Association of Asian American Studies Conference in San Francisco, and he talked about this. And it's a really uh, great project um, in terms of finding research materials, engaging with uh, different sources on the Chinese railroad workers. And what you may not know is that, uh, or may not uh, realize that next year is the 100th, 50th anniversary or so, as, as I uh, keep seeing all these programs coming up. And this is a great way to engage with your students, your research um, projects to get some ideas. And what they've done is digitize manuscripts, maps, um, different kinds of timelines they've created. And we're gonna share some of these tools that we found that could be helpful. But more importantly, um, it creates all these kinds of resources that could be um, great for, right, thank you, Amanda, for spatial and textual analysis and all this other um, really fun things that um, you may not uh, have noticed earlier with traditional primary source materials. So there are all these um, uh, features that you can zoom in and get a better glimpse of who are the people right there and so forth and really encourage folks to use this as a possibly as an, a template, right, as an ideal to, to reach. And of course, it's, it's quite, you know, uh, it's, it's for those who have the resources and the means to do so, because it, it is, I will say, at Stanford University Libraries, they have that. But for those who are um, in grassroots level, I think you can really work with librarians, think about the resources and some of the tools that we'll share uh, today. Here's one that's quite interesting I found. This is a little uh, older. This is from NYU's Asian Pacific American Institute. So the Archivist of the Yellow Peril. So this was based on an exhibit that they had quite a bit. And looking at um, the context, the collection that is in uh, New York University and really featuring images, poems, and books. And you can actually go through um, the exhibit um, digitally. And it's quite, um, quite interesting to see how it, it, digital humanities was served early on, like for Asian American studies, was de developing over. And so this kind of institution really um, gives you some context of how and what was done on the issue of yellow, yellow peril. And I think uh, it could be quite a uh, example as well. Um, and I'm showing these examples to give you some context that you can engage with your classes or with your own projects and so forth. And now we are looking at different tools, resources on digital humanities. And I'm just gonna say a few, um, and I'm gonna ask Victoria too, are you familiar with them? Um, I've used History Pin and uh, pretty much most of them, except um, what well, Archive IT I just know about. What about you, Victoria? I work with Omeka a lot. Um, I created digital collections and ex exhibits in Omeka Classic, as well as um, Omeka S. Uh, the past couple of months, we've been using Omeka S here at Stony Brook University, and it's worked really well to publicize or highlight digital collections, so I enjoy using it. Um, I ha haven't used any of the other resources you have here. We have a librarian here at Stony Brook, uh, Kate Caston, who uses Voyant tools to text mine. Um, but I haven't actually used it yet, so I don't want to talk too much about it, but it seems like a pretty awesome tool. Yeah, it's actually quite great uh, for those who are not familiar. So History Pin is a great way to collect um, di uh, digitized collections that you can make and just put it in there um, using it. Similar to um, Omega and WordPress, I think many of you are familiar. Archive IT, uh, maybe uh, something to explore. But the mapping tools, um, ArcGIS, I think many of us might be familiar with um, Esri's product, which is a little sophisticated, but I've seen some um, projects where um, people started emerge creating uh, projects on diaspora or like migration movements using ArcGIS. And QGIS is actually the um, open source version, right? ArcGIS, your institutions may have it, but QGIS, you can also um, get it on your own. And there's a lot of really great videos on YouTube to learn how to use them. And Story Map, I uh, found, I believe somebody has. <coughs> excuse me, about different like timelines. And um, this is a good example to consider creating different um, uh, visuals using a timeline, such as story map uh, coming from the night lab. I recommend just uh, playing around with that and um, having uh, students use them if you like. But Voyant Tools is actually, as Victoria said, really interesting for textual analysis. It's free, it's open. You just dump your data and it could create um, uh, trees in terms of word clouds and connections, make all kinds of um, analysis of your repetition of your of the document or the, um, 
the text that you had submitted. So it's quite fun, um, especially if you're studying something that could be, um, um, I, it could tie into uh, sacred scriptures, for instance, like if you're looking at the Bible, the Quran, and, and you just want to like throw it in there and see how many times some words have repeated itself and looking at the relationship, right? So um, I know people have done this with a lot of, a lot of um, primary texts. And so uh, I can speak um, a lot on that. But in terms of these other tools, I think for the opportunities for digital humanities projects, it's a great way to engage with folks. Um, and it's a great way to promote your own research um, that you can make it more accessible, particularly for those who are interested in oral history and uh, local history collections and so forth that you want to go out and um, gather. So I am gonna pass it to Victoria here. Thanks, Ray. <clears throat> um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about a digital project that was had already been started by the time I came to Stony Brook. I came to Stony Brook University about two years ago, and um, I was very excited to work on this project that was actually faculty proposed. I had not worked on a project that was faculty proposed before. I was very much used to working on projects where librarians kind of sat around and thought about, uh, prioritized our own collections. So. I think it's a great opportunity for uh, faculty work to work with librarians to build collections and to use in their class. And this, I'm just going to give a shout out to the instructor of this course, Peg Kristoff. She um, teaches an Asian, Asian American studies department here at Stony Brook University. And she has a class called Women in US Asian Relations. And what has already been established before I got, before I came to Stony Brook is we had the library had accepted this digital project uh, basically students were going to be interviewing women who would make contributions to US Asian relations and we would build a collection based on these oral history it's I call it an untraditional oral history just because the collection that we're outputting to the public does not actually consist of the recorded interviews. Since it's a student project, the students did interview these women, but the project that they presented in class or for this class was a summary of the interview. And they also produced a PowerPoint presentation that, that they presented in, to their classmates. So I'm just going to read a little bit um, how the instructor describes this project. It's a final project, students and women in U.S.-Asian relations set out, to in, they set out to interview women who are committed to enhancing U.S.-Asian relations. Women's contributions occur at many different levels of society and encompass a variety of occupations. In conducting oral history interviews, students prepare documentation for the Melville Library's digital collection and in the process acquire deep knowledge about women's social, cultural, political, and economic roles in the United States and Asia, which includes those in Asian American communities. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Ray. Thanks. Um, so this is, these are the three files that are presented in our Omeka collection. So this collection was built using our uh, Omeka Classic and will be moved to Omeka S shortly. I received Word documents, PDFs, and PowerPoints and I prepared the files. I made archive copies and also access copies. Um, dealing with PowerPoint, um, I decided to create a PDF of the PowerPoint just in case a user could not open a PowerPoint in Omeka or just could not open a PowerPoint in general. And <clears throat> next slide, please, Ray. So this was my first oral history project as well. So I had to do some research um, I studied copyright before, so it was very interesting and great to learn that the interviewee in oral history holds a copyright to their interview. Since we were dealing with summaries of interviews, um, it was a little bit different way to think about this oral history project. Uh, we did acquire release forms signed by the interviewees, but even though we had these release forms to make the project's public, it was still important to be in touch with the interviewees after the projects were done because these were the students' summaries of the interviews and after some of the interviewees 
read the summaries, they had some changes they wanted to make, which is perfectly acceptable even in actual recording or transaction of a recording for the interviewee to want to change something. And this brought up a lot of interesting things for, well, basically things for me to think about as far as privacy goes, which I've been studying a lot lately when just building digital collections in general. So I looked to um, <clears throat> the Oral History Association website and also uh, Columbia University Libraries, Columbia Center for Oral History to basically gain knowledge on how to build an oral history collection. Uh, next slide, please, Ray. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about openness and privacy. This collection was supposed to be supposed to be open to the public. With Omeka, um, <clears throat> you we are able to. Actually, this collection was built on another with another uh, software first, but we do have an Omeka now. After some of the interviewees read their summaries and what was going to be made public, they decided they didn't want to make their interviews public anymore and just wanted it to be used for classroom use. And that's why you can see in this slide, we have some restricted access next to names, which is perfectly acceptable again. And we're just happy to have such a great collection um, that's used in the classroom and also is made available to the public for most cases for this class. Um, <clears throat> So what you're seeing on the screen is kind of acts as our, it acts as our homepage before entering the Omeka site. So a user can just click on a name and enter directly into that, into that collection. So basically I just wanted to point out that when we work on these projects, it's important to consider the content, especially if we were, if we were presenting is not in our own words and to think about if there are any privacy concerns and, and for this, project in particular, there were quite a, f well, about a handful of interviews that had to be re-examined and thought about as far as if we were going to make them accessible or not. Um, next slide, please, Ray. Uh, this is just another resource I use, Oral History in the Digital Age, Protecting IP Rights to Life Histories, which was very informative. I just wanted to share that. Um, so, as I said before, uh, studying copyright, to know about copyright, creative commons licenses, intellectual pro property, but also privacy, all these things should be considered when building these digital collections or used for a digital project. And a librarian should be, should be able to help you with that, if you're building a project, just to keep these things in mind. Is, what you have that you want to make public, can you, are you allowed, is it by law, can you, and even if it is lawful to make something openly accessible, is there a possible privacy concern where you might want to gain permission, especially if you're telling someone else's story? And a librarian should be able to help you with these, just talking about these things with the community, your librarian should be able to help you with some copyright and intellectual property issues. So next slide, please, Ray. So some of the results of this project, it was a great project. The students uh, really enjoy being in, interactive in their studies. So a result, dissemination of personal accounts of women making contributions to US Asian relations, uh, student involvement in history documentation, student appreciation, and the interviewees are really happy to support students and to also share their story. And the instructor has testimonials from students and interviewees alike about how wonderful the project is. And I feel like the takeaway of this project is really collaboration, working with students, working with the instructor. And this is an ongoing project. It happens every year. I'll be adding more interviews this summer. And getting involved with the community, learning about what's important to them, listening to all the stakeholders involved is the end goal to have a, have a great digital collection that you can hopefully make accessible. And I, next, I am done. On to you, Ray. <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks. That was really interesting to hear about the copyright. I always forget about that. I'm sure for <laughs> Yeah, like the oral history in University of Washington, uh, FIFA probably had to get a lot of copyright, you know, uh, you know, agreements from the 
local communities. Yes, very important. Yeah, so um, thank you for that. And so now we'll move on to another case study that I have been working on. And it's actually about um, 9066. For those who are not familiar with 9066, as I alluded to earlier, it's an executive order where when the President of the United States had signed uh, a executive order to ensure that uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1942 authorized the Secretary of War at the time to prescribe certain areas as military zones for Japanese Americans, German Americans, Italian Americans in US concentration camps. Now I'm saying this because I think um, for many of us who are in Asian American studies and who are teaching history and you know, these kinds of really important issues, a lot of uh, people just seem to have forgotten that this existed. I mean, there's been some really interesting um, discussions I've been having lately with folks who are um, not familiar with this and seems to be under the radar. So what happened last year was that it was a uh, remembrance of the 75th anniversary last year. And so there were a lot of exhibits, programs, activities, discussions, and so forth. And at Fresno State, we actually did something uh, to support this. We had an exhibit and we also worked on a project that was able to engage with our community. So I'm gonna just throw this question out there as a poll if you wanna respond. Um, yes, thank you, Art Store has a lot of stuff too. Um, yeah, and so um, this poll right here is Wikipedia. Has anyone organized a Wikipedia edit-a-thon before or participated in one? And you could just uh, type in your uh, in the chat box, yes or no, or you can just wait till we uh, we get some responses. And Victoria, have you participated in one before? Yes, I have. Um, I that we had two, well, actually three Wikipedia editathons that I am aware of here at Stony Brook University, and they usually coincide with our uh, with Open Access Week. I think the first one was sci, uh, STEM specific though, and worked with a classroom in our STEM fields. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very cool. So uh, some of you, have, most of you have said yes, some of you have said no, but it's a great way to really engage with your communities, with your students and learners and so forth. It's actually a great way to improve Wikipedia entries. So what happened was that, um, as I mentioned, this was signed in uh, 1942 by uh, President uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt and ordering Japanese American ancestry to go, go into these camps. And Fresno happened to have um, some areas, uh, designated zones. And what we did was we um, created an exhibit. Oh, we created an exhibit, but we wanted to utilize uh, Wikipedia as a way to engage students with special collections. We have material cultures, primary sources, online resources, things that could uh, enhance and uh, reveal those hidden uh, voices, collections, and people that were um, incarcerated. So it's a really great opportunity to engage with your students to work on this project. Now, I will say that this is not necessarily, um, quote unquote, a innovative digital humanities project or any of that sense, but it's a way to engage with students using print materials and digital media, right? Because you're using Wikipedia that's open <coughs> and available and you're using special collections and you're trying to make that intersection of ensuring that lo um, lo com local communities and their voices, especially those who experience um, such um, tr tragic tragedy in American history, um, can really be um, affirmed through these um, sources. And so, um, as I mentioned, we had an exhibit here, it was great. And we had done a Wikipedia edit-a-thon to support the exhibit, to have our different classes in Asian American studies, English, history, to really be <coughs> part of this um, um, uh, movement, right? To engage with what we've been doing. And so I think this is a key element where libraries can really support um, these kinds of learning efforts with teaching and practice, teaching, teacher, fa teaching faculties and teaching practices, but also with the uh, community members. We also invited community members to partake in this community um, activity. And so I wanted to draw in here um, these three key points. Um, we're really drawing on the connection between past and present resources. As I said, the exhibits really demonstrate the clothes of things that people brought with them and have students um, utilize that information and put that in Wikipedia um, or the, the, the reference sources that we have as well. And really creating that collaborative space to explore new topics, gaps, or cited resources. We had one student who 
um, wanted to focus on Japanese American women's experience, and she was able to find some primary sources, but um, reference sources too. And so there's also the idea of uh, focusing on hidden histories, hidden collections, things that have sort of fell off the traditional quote unquote history path. And so it's quite a um, um, interesting experience. But of course, um, as um, we have seen, there's also ways to ensure that what you put on Wikipedia has to be credible and cited. And so we, we recommend it strongly to, for students to cite everything that they found, particularly um, reference materials and so forth. And so, um, as mentioned in the chat box, yes, uh, they, they can be territorial. But what we found was that there was a limited, limited articles on specific people who survived the incarceration experience. And that's a telling sign because we actually have some of that material to ensure that there's more content and more um, a, a substance, right, to, to really think about for those who are conducting research in the future or in the present. So this was a, uh, the flyer and this was the act program. We utilized different resources, reference materials, digital sources, and our um, archivists. So I partnered with our special collections and the archive archivists to ensure that we um, do this event and engage with the, spe uh, the special exhibits we have going on. And this is a quite fruitful uh, attempt to um, work with um, those who are in libraries, the public service side with the special collection side, because that in itself has always been quite territorial. But this was an opportunity to bridge those gaps to ensure that our community um, really learn about this experience through Wikipedia Edit-a-thon. And so I thought this was quite a, a, a great project. And for those who may not have that kind of reference material out there, and you can also look at this kind of uh, encyclopedia, the Densho, a free online resource, and look at those primary sources and add them into the Wikipedia project. You can do it individually as an assignment and so forth. And yes, thank you for pointing that out. Canadian Japanese have had similar experience as well. So um, our emphasis was looking at Fresno, the area. And, and for those who were interested in looking at the experiences of those who have survived and um, the, the major ones like George Takei and so forth and his family, I think that drew a lot of interest for those who were um, curious of how it has impacted the community today. And I think one of the things we wanted to uh, draw on is the parallel experiences of the, the Muslim Americans going on today, immigrant experiences. And I think it's quite harrowing to see this happening, um, not to get too political, but to, to draw on those par parallel experiences and to ensure that this never happens again, yes, but has, is it over, right? That, that's sort of like the main question, is systemic racism and oppression in America over? So I think this kind of activity, um, in addition to the exhibits and all these other programs we're doing, really um, fosters those dialogue with those who are not familiar with such experience. So I recommend those to um, really create a landing page. So um, this is a, a general one we did last year. You can see all the directions that we had students look at and the faculty, there were some faculty involved and some of the names down there, more information needed for Mitsuya Endo, you know, or, or these other um, uh, folks like the redress movements. So I think that was one way you could sort of get involved by planning ahead, ensuring that some specific content is needed and you can have the students follow those um, key directives. And so what really happened? Well, like I said, the community participants were engaged with library reference materials. That's, that's new. I mean, this, usually they were just sitting there in the shelves and not being touched for years, but this is an opportunity to add new sources and information online. So Wikipedia has a really easy way to cite things and we and then encourage students to identify those gaps and missing information. And what's even more interesting is that students become interested, engaged with research. They were like, wow, this is actually fun. I'm actually contributing to the knowledge of what is limited, what is lacking. And looking at that perspective can be quite helpful for them to ensure that their role is key to ensuring that um, quality information and content is ensured. And there's also text analysis of words in Wikipedia pages. Like I was saying, just looking at different kinds of sources out there. And that helps you actually understand what gaps you have in your own collection. So for us, we, we have um, quite a bit, but we could do more um, collections in Asian American studies or Asian American history. And so if your library is limited, then it's an opportunity for you to order more of those materials, right? It helps you do a collection audit. 
And so <clears throat> that's sort of uh, our way of thinking of how this um, Wikipedia uh, edit-a-thon, this project engaged with different levels of um, uh, processes, right? In terms of collection, engagement, learning, and resources. So here are just some general notes on best practices for those who have not, never done it. And for those who have done it, please feel free to share. I've seen the chat box uh, filling up. That's really great. So working closely with different partners to promote your program in marketing and communication strategy, that's key. We work closely with our cross-cultural gender center, ethnic studies, including Asian American studies program and history program and the special collections. And how do you get students to participate? Well, that's a great question because we would get um, the professors to assign extra credit. We actually had, um, we were planning to have um, doing it in the classroom, but I think the timing was a challenging for many of us. So that's one way to embed yourself in the classrooms and then do it. Of course, that's um, um, doable because I'm gonna talk about it in the next slide, but um, that's one way to engage with students. Also having refreshment, that's also important. And having those like, people students who are writing the um school newspaper we've had those people come in participate write about their experience and that's a great way to promote that um that program in itself even afterwards after it's over assembling reference materials using um, print and digital and create and having laptops available too and one important point i wanted to make not to get into this too much because we want to focus on digital humanities project is really creating Wikipedia accounts in advance because if you start creating them all at once, they are going to shut you down because they think there's going to be some hacking going on. So ensure that you create a few here and there and have students work in groups as suggested. That's always a great way to start um, in teams or um, really identifying those specific entries, those gaps that exist in those entries uh, can be a great way to start your activity. Now, I wanted to mention here also in the context of Asian American or Asian Pacific American women's her story. And we've also done stuff here every year, every March to uh, celebrate Asia, uh, Women's History Month. But we also want to remember that there is this intersectionality, right, in the digital space that's limited. So this came from Arlis, the Art Library um, Association of North America and it's a, a, a flyer that we, we adapted to promote our women's her story edit-a-thon. We were specifically interested in um, women of color, their experiences and participating and so for me I work closely with our colleague here Bang Bang, she's in the picture, she's our women's studies librarian and also with the women's studies department. So this was a way to engage with different um, community groups and also students getting extra credit or just doing it because they want to, they're curious and for my own experience, um, I'm involved because I'm the liaison to student affairs. I don't have a specific subject per se, but that means that I work with our cross-cultural gender center or in some universities, the Office of Diversity and Inclusivity. So this was an opportunity to bring them along and promote it and get them to um, support us and we um, helping them too because they have a series of programs and events. And so this activity um, was embedded in several layers. First, we did a drop-in workshop where people can just come in. This was the first two years when I was here, and this was great. So students came in, they were participating, and we wanted their experiences to be meaningful. And then the second part, which happened this past spring, was that we were embedded in the classrooms, like Women's Studies 101. We were out there doing it, and you're probably thinking, how do you get a one-on-one -on -one class to get involved? Well, actually, I think the professor was really keen on ensuring that there is information on women's studies and that sort of the, the, the challenges, right? And looking at the issues going on today from um, the hashtag Me Too movement to gender inequity in pay and looking at all of these issues and how do we um, ensure that this goes into um, the mainstream sort of Wikipedia resource? So we had done that a couple of times and uh, the students had to work in groups and it was also a great way for them to just see how information is um, transferred, right, from one resource to another. And what we required was a reflection. We wanted the students to reflect on their experience as part of the assignment. And then I checked in with the professor and she said, yeah, the, the reflections were mixed because there were some who got it and some who were like not really getting this Wikipedia project. But she said this was a good attempt to ensure that they were getting involved. Now I wanted to end on this note so we have more time for um, really discussions, Q&A, for people to share their experiences. So it comes down to this idea of community activism and digital scholarship and what we have 
done is shown that there are ways to engage, to promote, to really foster those relationships with marginalized and local communities. But I think in itself, this is important because I think digital humanities and scholarship has been rooted in a really one-dimensional approach of understanding how scholarship is transforming, right, in terms of innovation. And it seems to be limited to um, the experiences of people of color, um, the, our marginalized communities and different groups. And so I think this webinar in itself was designed to start the conversation. It, it's not necessarily this is it and off you go. This is the first of many I, I believe, and, and I would be very excited to see more of these projects, more of these webinars, activities going on, because it's important, right, to highlight this really um, diverse collection that we have, diverse resources, our service, our need to promote inclusivity and diversity in this field. So um, I wanted to say in some ways it really is community activism. You're getting community people involved. You're trying to make change. And that in itself is the essence of really um, ethnic studies, right? Like social justice and um, looking at that kind of engagement that might be limited in the mainstream quote unquote academic disciplines or uh, discourse that we see today. So I will end here and I'll let Victoria, if you have other um, last words you want to add. I just wanted to continue what you're saying um, and just I'm always so impressed by digital humanities projects that people see they want to create and I'm as a digital projects librarian just happy to support those ideas and help in any way I can. Yeah, thank you. So now we have time for Q&A and uh, we have about a good 10 minutes or so. You're welcome to chat. You can use the audio if you like, or the video and or video, or you can use the chat box and we will go through them. Questions, comments, any projects you'd like to share uh, will be great. Oh, I see here a comment on uh, the, from UCLA, Jeannie Chen, talking about Asian American literature professor invited her to join the annual pilgrimage to Manzanar War Relocation Center in California. Very cool. Thank you for um, sharing that. Oh, Julie had a question. So what role did IT department play in projects? So Victoria, do you wanna take on that? Sure, uh, well, we are fortunate to have a library IT department here at Stony Brook University. I know that not everyone is that fortunate. Um, and we have programmer and analysts that are dedicated to maintain our servers for digital collections. So for this oral history project, um, I worked with our programmer um, to create the instance in Omeka and um, basically any issues that we had with any plugins we were able to work together on. So I must say I'm quite fortunate to have that scenario here. Uh, but definitely IT plays a role because you need these platforms to work. And even though Mecca is great for people who are not programmers, um, especially if your institution is hosting such a platform, it's great to have IT support. I wish we did. <laughs> yeah, I think for some of us, I'm, we have some mapping projects. I don't really consider them as digital humanities projects or just in general mapping projects of California and IT plays a role by giving storage. We have a library IT too. So just know that if you are a teaching faculty or um, even a librarian, there's, you know, the library IT can be essential to ensuring there's that data storage. But uh, we have another question here about um, preservation plan and who is maintaining them, especially after the related classes ended. Do you have any thoughts on this, Victoria? I do, and that's a really great question because actually I could speak to uh, two different sides of that. The oral history project that I pre just presented on, um, that will be preserved. I, it was a little difficult because of the file formats, but I do have preservation copies of those files and we have a preservation plan for our files. <clears throat> but the other side of that is when I worked with our, the graduate student taking the digital humanities course, um, it was very apparent at that time to try to figure out how, because the student wanted to build 
or has hopes to build a digital collection. And it was kind of out of the, it, it's not necessarily in the scope of what we would take on as a digital collection, or it could, I'm just speaking generally, and it could be, but it wasn't discussed, it wasn't assessed as such. It was just as a learning experience for the student. We don't have plans on retaining that collection. So it became apparent at that time, how do we prepare and help students to take these projects with them after school if it's not something that the library is holding on to, which we are with this oral history project that was proposed by the faculty member. So it's something to think about. At this time, we don't have any um, plans on retaining the Digital Humanities Student Project, but that's only because we haven't gotten to that yet here as a discussion. But I think it's something we would, we definitely want to talk about and hopefully can support student digital humanities projects, especially if they're not necessarily in the university's collection development policy. Yeah, that is a great question in terms of because um, I'm more in the engagement side. So I, I believe Victoria has a lot of the back end experience. For me, it's more been looking at how do we engage with uh, related content. But I could say that some of the projects at NYPL labs, they had to phase out like they're not active or maintained. It's just um, I think they, they haven't thought through of the preser preservation plan, but some of them, because of their levels of activities have been consistent, they were able to be maintained through um, different kinds of web archive applications. I can't get into specifics because it's been a while, but I can just say that um, for the Wikipedia project, it's quite interesting because somebody had asked me, because I gave a, a, a segment of this talk, part of it, in Germany last year for another conference just to sh demonstrate the levels of engagements that can happen. And somebody asked, well, are you archiving the Wikipedia pages? Because people like the Wikipedia police or the Gestapo might like delete or change your, your content. And I said, that's a great point. But I don't think we have had that sort of urge to archive this stuff to sh demonstrate that there's engagement. I think my experience has always been just that, that point of engagement in the beginning. And so that gave me some things to think about. And I'm sure there are tools out there. I think Archive IT, I might have to look into that, may have that um, example. But there's another question here about the interviews, Victoria. I think this one's for you. Are they streamed? Hi, uh, the interviews are not streamed because um, we don't have the actual, I don't have the, I have about maybe five out of 60 recording files of the actual interview recording. And the actual recording of the interview was not the main content or purpose for the student's project. Well, I shouldn't say purpose. Obviously, it was the main part of their project, but the end goal or what they submitted uh, for a grade or for their project was the summary, their written summary of the interview. So the actual recorded interviews are not streamed and they are not in the online exhibit. But again, this is an ongoing project and I constantly in talks with the instructor and everything can, we're, we're thinking about about that exact question. So I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's also, um, thank you, Anne, for sharing. Congratulations on your award. I believe Anne can share the URL. So there is a question here um, by uh, Freda Lynn. I write curriculum for K-12 students and work with APA nonprofits to bring APA lessons to classrooms. Have these projects been introduced into primary and secondary school classrooms? If so, are there any outlines or guidelines on how to integrate this? That's a really great question. Um, Victoria, do you have thoughts on this? Um, that is a really good question. There, the DPLA has a wonderful uh, primary sources for K to 12. Um, I'm not sure if any of these projects that you presented on, Ray, are in the DPLA. Um, oh, no, no, not, not with DPLA, but um, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, no, that's, it's, it's tricky. I know, 
I could say, I think the San Francisco Public Library has done stuff recently on um, Angel Island, and uh, this was based on a talk, but this is not necessarily directly with Digital Humanities, but this is with like the sources that they have. And they've invited a lot of K-12 students, and I actually know the, the person, um, Jerry Deer, who's the coordinator or the educator, librarian for this program. And I, I remember hearing him talk about it. Um, but in terms of the existing content that we have, I don't, I, I, I have taught K-12 like just like research workshops when they came into the New York Public Library, but I um, didn't use any standards or guidelines, but that is something that I think um, could be investigated. Um, there's a gap right there, um, not, you know, to my knowledge, but if anyone else has any ideas, uh, please feel free to um, share. Oh, thank you, Judy, no problem. Yes, we could we could uh, think about that and share it with you. Oh, thank you, Sarah, to uh, work with, yes, LIS and other departments at the university level, um, particularly the teacher's programs if you have. And then, um, so if, if I was the education librarian, I, that's what I would be doing, right? Working with future teachers or, te or student teachers who are observing, giving, our, giving um, teaching demos and so forth. That would be one way to um, engage those kinds of content. All right, it looks like we have a few more comments here. Thank you for sharing the DPLA, Jennifer. And thank you, Sarah, again for, yes, the integrating the digital media into their research on children's books. Um, very cool. Um, okay. Any other last comments or thoughts? And if we had missed your question, please feel free to type it again. Otherwise, we appreciate you taking the time to join us, share your thoughts and experiences, and hopefully you found it helpful and engaging. Um, yes, a, a prob probably I will have to make another one uh, next year. Maybe I'll ask uh, if Victoria has time. Uh, this is part of the hashtag project, so uh, maybe we'll do another one on different panels, maybe on ethnic studies and so forth. And so, thank you, Anne. So um, I believe it's uh, time's up for everyone. If you have to go, please feel free. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all for coming and hope you have a great day. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Thank you. And you're welcome to um, email us if you have questions and thoughts, uh, particularly those who are interested in those instruction plans.